Jesus, you may be seated, Jesus was preaching and teaching his disciples. He was healing the sick. He was casting out demons. And his cousin was John the Baptist. Jesus' elder cousin, John the Baptist, was about three to six months older than Jesus. And when Jesus was born and Herod was born, remember Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Not Herod, but uh, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, King Herod declared that all baby Jewish male boys to be slaughtered under the age of two. Because Herod heard that there was a king being born. And in his uh, inferiority and in his pride, he called for the slaughter of innocents. Well, John the Baptist was just three to six months older than Jesus, so he was already born, and his mom and daddy did not take him to Egypt. Jesus' mom and dad, Joseph and Mary, took Jesus to Egypt. John the Baptist's mom and dad took him to the desert, and John the Baptist was the most mighty prophetic preacher to ever walk the planet outside of Jesus Christ himself. Jesus says, born of a woman, there is no one greater than John. John dedicated his life to prayer. John met Jesus in the secret place. In extra biblical uh, history, they called John camel knees. Uh, His knees were so calloused that they looked like the knees of a camel because of his prayer life. Scripture tells us that John ate locusts and he wore camel's, camel clothes and he, he didn't shave, he didn't smell good, he had bug breath, he, he lived in the desert. But his message of repentance called the people out of luxury, out of the cities, out of the, the conveniences. They, they called people out of their complacency. And they would travel a day's journey into the hot 110 plus degree desert to hear John preach. When you preach the gospel of Jesus, people will get uncomfortable. Can I get an amen? Jesus said, none born of a woman is greater than this prophet. What made John so great? What made John, did he go to eloquent preacher school? Did he go to, you know, uh, 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 you know desert, bug breath, camel, long hair guy school? What, what made him so great? He, he's not recorded as doing any miracles. John's not recorded in scripture that he, that he healed the sick, that he raised the dead. He, he may have, but, but it's not recorded that he was a miracle worker. It's recorded that he was a preacher that called people to repentance. He was a preacher that spoke to the religious heart and said, you need to quit playing God, quit playing church, quit playing Christian Quit playing good guy, good girl. You need to do something about your walk with God. Do works of repentance. Jesus one day goes and meets this John in the desert. They weren't close. They were cousins, but yet it wasn't like they grew up together. It wasn't like they hung out together. When John saw Jesus... He drops to his knees and says, behold, the son of God. His prophetic intuitiveness with the spirit of God allowed him to see the calling on other people's lives. He says, behold, the son of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. John preached, repent from your sins. Jesus preached, I'll take your sin." Jesus says, John, baptize me. Now, just remember a couple things. John had amassed a great following at this time. 
John had disciples. He had a church. He had a following. His Twitter account was way up here. His Facebook page was way up here. He was on the, he was the buzz, the talk of the town. But this great preacher in his great humility says, whoa, 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 I'm not the guy. I'm not the, if, if you read close enough, people came out to John and said, are you Elijah? Are you the prophet? Are you the Messiah? Are you the savior? And John could have adopted, oh yeah, I'm pretty good, right? Yeah, oh, I think I might be the Messiah. You know, no, 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 he continuously turned down the demonic flattery that would seduce him away from his calling of repentance. <clears throat> John says, behold the Son of God. Jesus says, baptize me. John says, whoa, 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 you got this backwards, Jesus. I'm not even worthy. I, I, I'm not even worthy to be the lowest of the lowest slave that could carry your shoes or wash your feet. I don't need to wash you. You need to wash me. Are you with me? Jesus says, John, allow it to be so. This is the fulfilling of scripture. John baptizes Jesus in the Jordan, the dirty river Jordan, the same Jordan that 500 years earlier or 1,000 years earlier, Joshua leads the Israelites out of Egypt, out of bondage, in a picture of baptism through the Jordan into the promised land. The Jews have now been in the promised land for a thousand years, give or take. Jesus is baptized. He comes up. John sees the Spirit of God descend upon him in the gentleness, the warmth, the beauty of a dove. Not a bird that flaps down and lands on his shoulder like a pirate. No, no. This is the beauty, descriptive Warmth and power of the Spirit of God. Can I get an amen? amen? At that moment, John's ministry was done. Hear me. At that moment, John was now second to the Messiah, the King of Kings, God himself in the flesh. Are you with me? And in his great humility, he says, oh, this is great. John continues to do his ministry as God ordains it. John goes to King Herod, the king of the Jews at the time, and says, Herod, it is unlawful for you to have ditched your wife and taken your brother's wife. That is adultery. That's fornication. You're supposed to be the king of God's people, leading the example for God's people. You are supposed to be the, the you know, you are the king. It is unlawful. So a uh, the boldness in John stood up to the king of the land, the king that in 2.2 seconds could call for his head, the king that could do whatever he wants to do to John, doesn't matter his prophet status, doesn't matter that he's the baptizer of Jesus, doesn't matter what anybody else thinks, the king can do what the king wants to do, no, no questions asked. Are you with me? Amen. So King Herod has him arrested and thrown in prison. John continues to speak to his disciples. One day, John, great John, doesn't tell us how long he was in prison, probably close to a year or more. And at some point in his prison cell, he breaks. And he calls his disciples to him and he says, hey, listen, Thank you for bringing me bread. Thank you for bringing me water. Thank you for bringing me a change of clothes. Thank you for bringing me some medicine because we don't get any of that here. You got to provide for me. Thank you so much for, but the biggest question that's been racking my brain for the last 30 days in this prison cell beneath ground with the mice and the roaches and the stench and the sewage and the lack and the, and the great horrendousness of that situation, this question is racking my soul. Listen, will you go ask my cousin, G will you go ask Jesus if he's the Messiah or should we be looking for another? Great John. 
circumstance breaks to the degree that he questions, is this really the Messiah? Now, he baptized him. He was the first one to declare who he was. He saw the Spirit of God descend upon him. He heard God say, this is my boy in whom I'm well pleased. He knew, but like you and I, life caught up with him. Are you with me? His disciples go and say, hey, Jesus, uh, man, I, I know you just walked on some water. I know you just fed 5,000 with some bread. I, those leper guys, that was crazy. Ten of them got healed. Only one comes back and says, thank you. That was, I mean, that guy, blind Bartimaeus, we were there. We saw you heal his eyes in the middle of the street. We saw you spit in the mud and slap your hands on that guy, and he got healed. We saw you take that prostitute, that lady caught in the midst of adultery, and you drew in the sand, and all the, all the elders ran away, and you, you raised her back to her dignity. God, we've seen all this, but hey, Jesus, we got to ask you this question. John needs to know, are you the one? In great Jesus fashion, Jesus could have been irritated. He could have tried to make a point. He could have been all prideful and cocky and said, go tell John to pull his head out. Yes, I'm the Messiah. Are you kidding me? He simply says this. <clears throat> Go remind John. Go tell John. The blind see. The deaf hear. The mute speak. The cripple walks. The dead are back to life. Tell John this last thing. Blessed is the man who's not offended because of me. Go tell John, Isaiah, Luke 4, go tell John that I've come to heal the brokenhearted, heal open blind eyes, open deaf ears, raise the dead, set the captive free, I am doing the work of the Messiah, but blessed would be John if he doesn't get offended because his life is about to end. Blessed would be John if he doesn't get offended that I didn't use him in the way that John thought he should be used. Blessed would John be that I didn't rescue him from prison. That Blessed would John be if he doesn't get offended that I didn't make him one of my 12 disciples. Ble wouldn't that make sense that John would be one of the 12? I mean, really? Are you kidding me? Go tell John, blessed is he who's not offended when life doesn't go the way When God doesn't do what you want God, when God doesn't come through, when, blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Are you with me? A few weeks later, Herod's wife and Herod are throwing a party. Her name is Herodias. <laughs> it's your first clue. Don't marry her. <laughs> God, I pray nobody's listening to name Herodias, but <laughs> I probably should have checked the Herod and Herodias, his wife, have a party. As with the Jezebel spirit that we've been talking of for the last few weeks, teenage daughter, teenagers when they're under the influence of a Jezebel spirit will take on what mom and dad allow and what mom and dad, how mom and dad operate. Teenage daughter dances seductively before Herod, a grown male, her stepfather and his cohorts, friends, sexually seductively. Herod, in his pride, says, oh, that was a great dance, great strip tease. You can have anything that you want up to half of my kingdom. Most young teenage girls would not ask for the head of John the Baptist. They would want a new chariot, new shoes, diamond ring, new house, you know, I don't know, swimming pool, something, something that teenagers, the credit card, the MasterCard, the gold one, or the Amex card, whatever color they are. Dad, what color are they now? He has all the latest, you know what I'm saying? 
Daughter goes to mom. Mom says, yeah, we want John's head. We want that prophet, that preacher. We want his head on a platter. Mom, I want a diamond ring. Shut up. Thanks for using your body to get what mama wants. Now go can finish the job. <sighs> so John is beheaded. His disciples come and get his body and bury him. Jesus then goes and does some of his greatest miracles in his time of mourning the death of his cousin. But Jesus makes this crazy statement in Matthew chapter 11. He's talking to his disciples. Now, he's not talking to those that don't believe. He's talking to those that believe, and he says this crazy thing right here. He says, <clears throat> John the Baptist, there's been none other like him. No other man born of a woman has ever preached the message he preached. He was the forerunner of Jesus. He was the guy with the machete making the way so the Son of God could come through and do what he was called to do. He was the forerunner of the ministry of the gospel of John. Stacy is the forerunner of the ministry before I preach. She is to break through spiritually through prophetic worship. There are forerunners that God has put in your life to make the way for you to do your ministry. Are you hearing that? Wives. Your husband is the forerunner. Oh, he doesn't know how to do it. That's a lie from the, he's the forerunner. Yes, yes, come on. Husband, your wife is the forerunner. Oh, she doesn't. Those are lies. Are you, are you with me? Jesus makes this statement. Matthew 11, he says, if you will believe it, John is Elijah. John the Baptist is Elijah? Now, he's not talking reincarnation. He's not talking ghost. And he is saying the spirit that was in Elijah, the boldness, the courage, the message, the prophetic, the national calling, the call for repentance, the the, 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 the one that will not allow you to have one foot in and one foot out, the guy that will call you out, the guy that will draw the line and say, are you with me or against me? Who's, who's side? The guy that will be stable, concrete, fire hydrant, bulldog, center of the football team. If you'll believe it, John has the same anointing as Elijah We've been talking about Jezebel's table and how Jesus is calling us out in Revelation chapter 2. So let's turn there. Revelation chapter 2, verse 18. If you don't read your Bible, please read Revelation chapters 1, 2, and 3. If you don't know where to start reading your Bible, if you say, I don't understand my Bible, start reading Revelation chapters 1, 2, and 3, and read them, exhaust them, read them over and over and over, because you'll never quit getting the message for today out of them. Are you with me? Jesus is talking to seven churches. These are seven real entities of the day and today. All nations, all churches, all Christians struggle with these seven areas of our walk with God. These seven churches represent my heart and your heart. They represent our walk with God. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 18, to the church of Thyatira. Let's start there. We're going to read through this passage. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira, write, These things says the Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and feet like fine brass. Now put your name here. God's talking. I know your works, Whitestone Church. I know how you love everybody that comes through the door. I know your service and overseas, and I know what you give to, the, to different ministry. I know your faith. I know, I know how many people get baptized and healed. I know your patience. You're, you're constantly persevering. 
And as for your works, you're doing more now in 2021 than you ever did before. But nevertheless, Cameron, Whitestone, I have a few things against you. Now, before we go on, Jezebel hates Elijah. In Kings, we've read it, Elijah slaughters the prophets of Baal that eat at Jezebel's table. He destroys and calls out the prophets of witchcraft and demonic activity and seduction. He calls people away from Jezebel's perversion back into holiness. Elijah had a message of repentance. Not let's get saved, once saved, always saved. No, no, no. Repentance. You have been a punk yesterday. And you have the audacity to say it's your spouse's fault. No, no, no. You're the one. Are, are you with me? Real repentance. Not sorry, not, oh, the, my bad, my bad, my bad, God. <laughs> repentance. Are you with me? Jezebel, Satan, wants to destroy the Elijah boldness in you. If Jezebel can strip Elijah anointing off of you, you will be no threat to the enemy. Okay? Keep the guy addicted to porn, no threat. Can't have a real walk with God. Keep, keep the girl addicted to pills, no threat. Keep dad addicted to work, consumed with money. Keep mama buying, buying, buying more cards, more credit, more. Just keep them entertained. Keep their eye off of God and on to something. Are you with me? Don't stand up for what you believe on. You need to be more tolerant. You need to be politically correct. How dare you stand for what you believe in? Are, are you with me? Let's pull out. Okay, when Jesus says nevertheless, he's not picking. He's not nitpicking. He's saying, if you don't change this thing, you'll lose the game. You won't just lose the down, the quarter, the play, the half. You'll lose the whole thing. Well, I can do what I want to do. I'm saved by the grace of God. Your theology, that theology, Satan loves. Oh, yeah, it doesn't matter what you do. Are, are you with me? Okay, let's go back. Verse 19, I think we were. Or 20. Nevertheless, Cameron, put your name there. Do not say, oh, man, this is for my wife. <clears throat> I'm going to leave this. You ever left the Bible open and put it right by their bed stand? Like you never do that ever, right? And you highlight it and you leave it open in the kitchen saying, read this. You know, <laughs> this is for you. Okay. I've tried. It doesn't work. <laughs> Actually, I left a note on the floor when the dog pooped. You remember that? That was horrible. Yeah, she remembers that. I put a note. Instead of picking it up myself, I just put a note. This needs to be cleaned up. It was a bad day. Yeah, it was a bad day. It was a bad dog. It was a bad dog. Okay. <laughs> Nevertheless, I have this. I'm sorry. Nevertheless, I have these things against you. Because, Cameron, you're allowing that woman. Now, it's not talking about just another physical woman. This isn't God, men beyond. No, no, no. This is a spirit. It's a demon. Now, the reason Jesus says woman, Jezebel, is because he wants you to go back and read about the real Jezebel in the Bible not to say, oh, what a bad woman, but to pull out the characteristics, to pull out the warning signs to say, this is how she operated. Because it wasn't Jezebel operating, it's a demon in her operating who calls herself a prophetess. Rod talked about it just a few minutes ago. There's a lot of self-proclaimed prophets. Not just in the church, but outside the church that's influencing the church, okay? To teach and seduce my servants, my sons, my daughters to commit sexual immorality. Well, I'm, I'm not committing sexual immorality. Okay, but are you sexually committing immorality, immorality against God? 
That was Israel's problem. Israel likened, God likened Israel to a prostitute. Now, were all Israelites on the street corner selling their bodies? No, but they were all worshiping Baal. They were all worshiping Asherah. How many of us are worshiping, committing fornication with the God called money, status, security, bank account, 401k, retirement plan? Yeah, I'm not going to tithe. I'm going to fund my account. I need a rainy day fund. I don't trust God. I'm, I'm going to trust in the system. I'm not saying be an idiot, but I'm saying how many of us can say, well, I'm not cheating on my spouse. I'm not looking at porn. Pastor, I don't have a sexual immorality problem, but we're committing immorality against God because we sold our soul to another deity. So don't read this and say, not me. Read it and go, oh God, where am I at? Yes? In Sunday school, we were talking about like stupid gods we've worshipped in our life. Come back. <laughs> Who calls herself a prophetess, teaching my servants to commit sexual immorality. Remember when Jesus says, um, thank you so much for feeding the poor and casting out demons and preaching in my name, but I never knew you. Remember that verse, that, that story? That's what Jesus is talking about. I never knew you intimately like a husband would know his wife. It has nothing to do with the physical act of sexual inter intercourse. It has everything to do with intimacy. Thank you for coming to church. Thanks for putting money in the plate. Thank you so much for teaching Sunday school, feeding the homeless, going to the prison. Thank you, thank you, thank you. But you know what, dude? I just never even really got to know you because you never stopped doing to just be. Remember, I know your works, and you're doing a lot more today than you've ever done. But there's this thing. <laughs> and eat things sacrificed to idols. So quickly, we're not talking about food in front of a little statue at the buffet restaurant down the street. We're talking about demonology. Satan doesn't care what you physically put in your, oh, let's eat pig, let's eat, you know, that's what, that's what Jesus dealt with. The next. It's not about the food you eat. Now, now yes, we don't take our food, and, but do we thank our employer for our food? Whew, man, I got, my, my, my boss treats me well. My job, I, I am so successful. I am a self-made millionaire. Mm-mm-mm. Oh, okay. So you're consuming demonology. Are, are you with me? The demonology of today goes so much more deeper than anything that we want to acknowledge, recognize, or see. But it has lulled the church asleep to be complacent, apathetic, weak, timid, and fearful to where we don't take a stand for holiness and righteousness in our own lives. In our own lives. Much less take a stand for holiness and righteousness in the life of our community, our city. Are, are you with me? Let's keep reading. I gave her time to repent. Ooh, what's Elijah's message? What's John the Baptist's message? Do you know how you know that you have a Jezebel spirit or an Ahab spirit? You will not repent. I don't know how many people I talk to and they will say, my spouse never apologizes. My spouse is never wrong. A Jezebel spirit will also dry up your tears physically. A lot of people that struggle with the Jezebel spirit have not cried in years, physically cried, because there's a hardening going on. I'm not saying just because you cry you don't have it, and I'm not saying because you don't cry, or, but you got to hear me. The enemy wants you to say, I'm sorry. 
but he does not want you to repent. John the Baptist looked at the Pharisees and Sadducees and says, do works of repentance. Who called you to come? John calls him out and says, who told you to come get baptized? You're not even repenting. You're not even doing works of repentance. You remember Zacchaeus, the wee little man, the wee little man was he? Zacchaeus climbed in a little tree, something, something. To the Lord he wanted to see. You remember that song? Okay, just me. Zacchaeus was a short guy, tax collector, Jewish tax collector for the Romans. So therefore, his people hated him. He would rip his own people off on top of what Rome was ripping them off and pocket his own, you know, same with Matthew who wrote the book of Matthew, one of the 12 disciples. Zacchaeus climbs in a tree because he wanted to see Jesus. Jesus stops and says, I must eat at your house, Zacchaeus. All the Pharisees are like, some Messiah he is going to the tax collector's house. I think there's prostitutes over there, drug dealers. But that's where he goes. Remember that? Do you know that Jesus never once told him to do what he, what he does? Zacchaeus is feeding Jesus. He's throwing a party, and he goes, Jesus, I'm going to repay everybody that I stole money from seven times. So if I took $100 from him, I'm going to give him back 700 up to, uh, uh, of, of everything I've ever stolen. Do you know Jesus never told him to do that? Do you know why he did it? Because he repented. How many of us just won't repent? We're too prideful to walk back in the store and say, excuse me, H-E-B clerk, I was a jerk because my little coupon didn't work, so I had to cop an attitude with you. Would you please forgive me? Jezebel does not want you to use the F word, and the F word is forgive. Are are you with me? Let's keep reading. We're going to get through this. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation. Why is my world falling apart, Pastor? Why are my kids going south, Pastor? Why is, my, why is this? Why is this? I, I don't know. Let's trace it back. Unless they repent of their deeds, I will kill her children. And just take the word children before you just think of, of small people on our planet. I will kill her works her businesses, her, her ventures. I will kill her dreams. I will kill everything that she tries to produce. Or, yes? And the churches, why would you do that, God? So Whitestone shall know that I am God. Hey, Cameron, I will tear down everything you build. Your little church kingdom, your little ministry, your little uh, uh, evangelistic gospel explosion that you're going to do, your little... If it's not rooted in me, I'll just destroy that bad boy because I'm mad at you and I want to teach you a lesson. No, no, because I love you so much. I don't want you to be committing adultery with another lover. I am a jealous God. Yes, Cameron, I will destroy your ability to watch television. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'll destroy your ability to just listen to music like you used to. I will destroy your ability to just consume any book, magazine, news article. I will destroy that for you so that you don't get consumed with Fox, CNN, MBS, BC, whatever, for 18 hours a day and get all of your information from that and not my word. Yes, I will destroy every, everything that you think is good, holy, and true for the real thing. Are, 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 are you with me? Yeah. Wasn't the worst day of your life when you took your, your wedding ring to the pawn shop and they told you it wasn't real gold? Anybody, anybody else do that? <laughs> right? I need, I need a $400 loan. Well, I'll give you $4 because this is cheap. No, it ain't. I paid 1000 But God's going to take everything that you think is real and expose it if we don't repent. Are you with me? Let's stand. There is an Elijah anointing that is going to fall and has fallen. I just want you to bow your heads. And I just want you to ask yourself, are you an Elijah? Are you an Ahab? Or are you a Jezebel? 
oh, preacher, that, that, that's, that's, oh, you're, oh, oh, that's crazy, that's crazy. Well, of course I'm an Elijah, I'm an Elijah. As your preacher, I so wish I could say. But I so many days find myself struggling over here being seduced. And then being fearful. And Elijah anointing is a spirit that will preach where the Lord commands. See, Cameron wants a big stage in the middle of America with the spotlight. But an Elijah will go to the desert. And that is so much more real than Elijah will go preach. John, no, no, you can't go to Jerusalem and preach. No, John, you'll never walk in the synagogue. Hey, John, no, those Sadducees, Pharisees, scribes, they will never know your name. You'll never be on that news magazine. You'll never be in, in that uh, stream of, of prophetic travelers around the world. You'll never be in that. John, the real preacher will go to the desert. Yeah, no, I know. There's nobody in the desert. Just some wild coyotes and some, some scorpions. But you just go out there and you pray and you preach for 25 years. Yeah, two decades. Hey, John, your mom and dad are going to take you out to the desert when you're two. Probably around the age of 10, you're going to start learning from the scribes and the Pharisees that live in the desert, or the, the teachers, that, the rulers, the, the godly men that live in the desert. Yeah, just preach to the rocks, preach to the animals, preach to your mom and dad. But a real Elijah will preach in the desert till the Messiah shows up. And that's power. Do, do you hear what I'm saying about your own life? The real man of God, the real woman of God will do what God tells them to do. And even when it doesn't look like anybody's there or anybody's with you, you just keep taking the stand doing what God's called you to do until the Messiah shows up. You got it. Do you hear that? Yes. And Elijah will not despise a small beginning. How many people dis despise their kids as an inconvenience? But think about the Elijah in your daughter, the Elijah in that boy. See, the world that says, oh, you got you to gotta, you gotta make a lot of money. You, gotta, you, can't, you can't afford to stay home. You got to make a lot of money. Don't despise raising those babies. And Elijah anointing will preach to dead places for years. And Elijah will preach to people that you think will never hear the gospel that are so close-minded, they're so bigoted and narrow. And Elijah will preach to a dead heart for years. And Elijah will not quit praying. And Elijah will not quit fasting. And Elijah will not quit loving on. And Elijah will not quit. Yes? Elijah will preach repentance. And Elijah anointing Rod Corton is a pioneering spirit that goes to uncharted territories. It's unwavering in its message. It's not flashy. It's not bling bling. It is not concerned with its own comfort to follow God. Well, I'll follow God. You know what? Yeah, God called me to start a church. Let me, let me go to, let me do some demographic study to find out where all the rich people in the city are. Now, if I go preach in that city, what kind of house am I going to live in, God? What kind of salary are they going to give me, God? What kind of car am I going to get to drive? And Elijah and Elijah will call religious people to repent. And Elijah will call a nation to repentance. When Billy Graham died, I prayed this prayer. I said, oh God, where's the next prophet for the nation? Who's, who's going to replace Billy Who's going to go 50 plus years with being faithful to his wife in the national spotlight? 
Who's going to go 50 plus years of meeting with every president and being a, a stable man of God for that man? Who's going who's gonna to preach and lead your nation? I'm telling you this. The Lord is calling the Elijah out of you or, or, or calling it up to rise up in you. Are you with me? And God is saying, you are losing because you're bowing to Baal. You're bowing to power, money, prestige. You are bowing to perversion. You are bowing to consuming doctrine of demons. God says, rise up, repent. 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 If you need to repent today, this is how we're going to close the service. If you need to repent today, I just want you to walk up to this altar right now.